Maria Mani to uh, our campus. This is her second visit. Uh, she came two years back uh, and read from her book called The Country Called America. And we're very happy that she's here again to read from this book that just came out yesterday. So um, we're actually the first college that she's visiting uh, and reading and talking about her work. Um, Alia um, was born in Baltimore to Syrian immigrant parents. Uh, she began her legal career as a trial attorney at the U.S. Department of Justice Civil Rights Division. Um, after working in the legal field in the U.S., Lebanon, and the West Bank, uh, Alia um, got decided to also be a journalist and an author, and I guess she's been all along, it's just now official. Uh, she went to Columbia University. Her undergraduate degree is from Johns Hopkins, and it's in uh, international relations and a minor in creative writing, right, Alia? And then her master's, not master's, the legal, um, the law degree is from um, Georgetown, and the journalism master's degree is from Columbia University. So that's an interesting trajectory of students are interested to see how you can combine legal work, human rights work, uh, and also creative writing um, uh, work. Um, Alia, um, as a journalist and civil rights lawyer, um, she's the author of a country called America. It came out in 2009. She's also the editor of a collection uh, called Patriot Acts, Narratives of Post-9-11 Injustices, and this came out in 2011. Um, she just, they just released a, a book called Europa, an illustrated introduction to Europe for migrants and refugees, uh, and uh, today, there's a party, and um, today she will be reading from her new, her new book called um, the home that was our country, uh, a memoir of Syria, where um, she uh, talks about um, nearly 100 years of Syrian history through actually a personal lens of, of her own uh, family. The book just came out and it's already been getting um, a great praise. And uh, we are actually lucky, we ordered copies, we have 25 copies, so if you want Alia to sign them and um, dedicate them personally to you, uh, you're more than welcome, we'll do that after. And I also want to thank uh, everyone that helped us, the students in our office, um, Joanna, Amiaz, we have actually contingency of people coming from Kenyan and uh, Worcester. This is part of, and I'll get them in order because I wrote them down, the Global Crossroad Grand Challenge um, Grand for the GSCA and also Denison University. So please help me welcome Alia to our campus. Five, 15 minutes, and then we're going to open the space for question and answer, and I'll take it from there. Thank you for being here. Hi, everybody. Is this okay? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you for those of you who came a solid two hours uh, to get here. I'm going to, so Aziz sort of gave me just some general parameters about what you wanted me to talk about. Um, she asked me how my publisher felt about me this being the first stop, because uh, the book published yesterday officially, uh, and I'm based in New York. <laughs> my publicist, the publicist at the publishing house was really hostile when he found out I, was, I had a, a commitment at Denison on March 1st, and I finally got to the bottom of it today. I'm like, what is this, what is up with this hostility to Dennis? And apparently his ex-girlfriend graduated from here. So. <laughs> He had so many things to say about Dennis, and it was bizarre. Anyway, so I'm just going to, I doubt I'm going to talk for 45 minutes. I'm going, oh, we'll see. I'll, I'll keep my clock on to see how, how long this takes. I'm going to kind of just give you like a, I don't know, a little, little bit of a talk, and then I'm going to read from the new book, which I haven't read from yet, so this is going to be, this could be rough, and then I'll happily do a, a little bit of a Q, actually, I'd much rather do a much longer Q&A, but Aziz refused to do it that way, so you're, you have to listen to me, and then once I read from the book, I'll put on the slideshow that I have to keep looking at in the meantime, which is just a bunch of pictures that cover um, some of the, the ground that's, uh, that the book covers. So I'm guessing here everybody heard about the travel ban that was announced uh, oh so uh, delicately a few weeks ago. It was announced on a Friday, and on that Saturday morning, I woke up to a panic message from my friend Kenan Azme, who was in Beirut at the time. He said he wanted to know in his text, do you think I can no longer come back to America? 
My friend Keenan is a virtuoso on clarinet and a brilliant composer. He had just debuted a new piece that he had composed uh, for Yo-Yo Ma with Yo-Yo Ma. He's a member of the Silk Road Ensemble, so they're good friends. And it had just been this massive concert in Germany. And Keenan had been flying to Beirut at the time that the band was announced to perform with the Lebanese orchestra that was hosting Russia, uh, musicians from Belarus when he heard about President Trump's executive order banning all refugees and citizens of the seven uh, Muslim-majority countries. So his message also asked, but only half-jokingly, do you need a place to live? My apartment might be empty from now on, sad face emoji. My apartment's better than his apartment, though, so I declined. Uh, Kinan, like me, is Syrian, but unlike me, he's not American. He's a green card holder. He's been in the U.S. since 2000 when he came to study at Juilliard, and he'll be eligible for citizenship in a few years. But the way that the plan was rolled out uh, caused a flurry of these kinds of confused conversations. Uh, there were a lot of texts and messages and panicked emails and phone calls that went around uh, the communities implicated by the, by the ban, people asking if it was worth it to take the risk of going abroad to fill concert halls or to attend loved ones' funerals of people who happened to pass away right at the time of the, of the ban, uh, or whether they should go present their research at the international conferences they had been invited to. Those are just some of the activities that I know, I just from personal experience, from personal um, relationships I know were disrupted. And it was also, though, the ban was another moment to, for Syrians to sort of pause and just shake our head at how surreal it is that Syria is now at the crux of everything, uh, both domestically and internationally, and kind of have this nostalgia for when it, what were the days when nobody knew anything about Syria. And growing up in Baltimore in the 1980s, even though my family's uh, inner life at home is very much shattered by Syria as if it were this other member of our household, it was always too small, too specific, and too irrelevant to be, part, to be a part of most Americans' consciousness. Sure, national, national politicians did sometimes mention Syria, but always as a lesser or minor character in the Israeli-Palestinian epic or in other good versus evil framings of the world. But that rarely ever filtered down to, uh, into everyday Americans' lives. Instead, Syria was just this intimate thing for me. Back then, Syria was where my family was always going to return after my father finished his medical training. But my parents gave up that dream in 1980. First, the regime uh, and its opponents were engaged in open and violent conflict, even back then. And second, uh, regime-affiliated men had murdered a member of my family and with impunity. We weren't able to do anything about it. And lastly, my mother's mother had suffered a crippling stroke that year that locked her in and eventually ended her life. So with my paternal grandmother having already died, and a few years before, Syria became kind of a motherless motherland uh, for both my parents, and they made the decision of to stay in Baltimore. Inside our house, in our family's consciousness, Syria became this alternate and sometimes mythical, sometimes romanticized reality where we would have been alternate versions of ourselves, where we would have had extended family, not relatives, who we saw in intervals separated by many years, where my parents had old friends and who could share stories about, my, about them as teenagers, where our parents didn't speak with accents and where they had the confidence of belonging to a place where, if nothing else, they shouldn't have been lonely. And so Syria only came up in conversation outside our house with fellow Americans when we were asked where we were from from. And, when, and, even, that, and even then, it really didn't mean anything. And sort of to illustrate, um, and this is, like, this is a weird kind of nostalgia, when I was a kid, uh, there was this kid who wanted to bully me. And like, everybody knew we were going to have a showdown on the, on the playground. Um, and I was taller, actually, than everybody. So if it had gotten physical, I would have definitely won. But he, come, he came up to me. And he, you know, I mean, like, we had separated. We were already, like, he walked up, and he was about to, like, throw down apparently something, you know, something tough. And he, you know, from all the other kids, he's like, so if you're from Syria, does that mean you eat a lot of cereal? <laughs> I mean, clearly didn't slay. I mean, I felt sorry for him. But like, that was sort of the, the idea that there was nothing there to really sort of associate Syria with in this, in this negative way. Of course, the more vicious uh, discourse in America at the time and what set us apart and the basis for the more vicious insults to come in life would be about being Arab generally and not Syrian specifically. And it was uh, that experience of being Arab hyphen American that initiated me in the condition of, of hyphenation in, in this country and set the course for, for my life and, and what I would go on to pursue as careers, first as, a, as an attorney in civil rights and then eventually as a journalist. Um, 
And the way I try to explain this condition, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of it, uh, just looking out at the diversity that is here, is that it sort of means being fluent in the mainstream or popular or accepted or consensus narratives about society or about the people who make it up, about the world uh, that we live in, while always seeing that that's a simplistic narrative, lacking nuance and even accuracy, and in fact knowing parallel and alternative narr and competing narratives to that. And I've thought about this a lot. You know, there might be a variety of reasons for those simplistic narratives, whether it's ignorance or malice or just laziness, but the result is singular. They are at best limited, incomplete narratives, and they help enable the stereotypes and the crude thinking, which ultimately, I think, devalue the lives of other people, people with whom we share a society. Um, and that means at best, at best, cringe-inducing pop culture representations, and at worst, the kind of regrettable policy that we are seeing in a much more blatant sense these days. And, and more importantly, and this is some, one of the reasons I wrote Amrika, it, oh, it deprives everyone else in society of truly knowing and valuing who makes up the place that, that we all share. So even as a kid in the 80s, I knew that the evening news was not giving us the full picture. And I felt stigmatized myself personally by the bad guys that they, that, and the stereotypes that I saw on both TV and film. And, and I try to explain this also to people. It's like this kind of hyphenation can make you feel on the margins, even as you succeed uh, within the system, as I have in, ostensibly. And even as I realize that the kind of success I've had is something I would have never been able to have realized in, in Syria. So I did, as Aziz pointed out, I went, I went to law school at the time. This was a long time ago. I can't even believe it. I think some of you guys were born when I graduated law school, which just makes me want to shoot myself. But um, <laughs> it's true. I graduated, I graduated law school in 2000, um, and I went to the Civil Rights Division and Department of Justice. I was the first Arab American honors attorney. Uh, and I had gone there because what I wanted to do was sort of you know, combat the effects of that kind of prejudice when it rose to the level of, of actions that were that you could you could address uh, in, in law, and that's where I was on 9/11. When uh, everybody knows what not happened on 9/11, right? I don't need to go back over that territory, but it meant being privy to some very interesting conversations uh, that would I think probably planted the seed. I was. Um, you know, right after 9-11, there was a lot of talk at the Department of Justice of, as to how these, um, how to sort of investigate and preempt these, what was, whatever they construed was happening. And I, ha I was in my office one day when a colleague of mine from the criminal division who's Haitian-American came in and he's like, I have to tell you what they were talking about upstairs when they were talking about, like, ideas of how they should, um, prosecute the so-called war on terror. So we did what any good government uh, bureaucrats did. We went to Au Pain, where like, you can basically find most of DC's workers around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And we had, this, he, we had this conversation. He said they were sort of batting around the idea. And these were people obviously from the front, from the political appointees, from the Bush administration, the Ashcroft White House. Um, uh, Ashcroft Department of Justice, who said, you know, people were throwing out the idea on the table that maybe we should denaturalize naturalized uh, Arab Americans, and these these would have been people like my parents. I'm I'm born in the U.S., but my parents were naturalized, and you know, I remember my jaw dropping. And of course, that was my fantasy when I was 13, like getting my parents deported back to Syria. But by the time I was, you know, charged with, you know. Uh, protecting and enforcing the nation's civil rights laws. I was like, this doesn't sound super kosher. Um, and I remember having this, the, thinking to myself, like, why is it possible to talk about uh, this, this, uh, this group of people, even though they've been here uh, all along? You know, Arabs have been coming to the United States since the late 1800s in the, in the same waves of immigration that brought over people uh, that we don't even hesitate to think about as, as quote unquote, full Americans. And that and I remember thinking that um, part of the problem was this invisibility, that there was no knowledge, no representation of Arabs as Americans and only a, as foreign. And I remember thinking at the time that really somebody should do something about it. And I, uh, I went on with my life. I was, you know, ready in, in debt for law school, and you know, I'd already committed to being uh, committed to being a lawyer. And um, you know, that's what I, I, I thought this was going to be somebody else's problem. Uh, but then. Uh, you know, life is funny, and you really don't have much control over it. And if you know, shortly thereafter, it became clear that the U.S. was going to invade Iraq. And after three years at the Department of Justice, I decided to resign my post, and I moved to Beirut. And I was uh, representing 
the refugees who were coming in from Iraq at the time in 2000, 2003, and my life went on. And then several years later, in 2005, I decided to get a master's in journalism at Columbia. And at that point, um, like a book that I thought needed to, a long thought needed to exist, hadn't yet come out, and not because I doubt, I mean, I don't, I, I don't doubt that people tried to, to sell a book like this before. I guess maybe it was a matter of timing and having those so-called right credentials, but that's why I wrote Enrica, which retold American history through um, Arab-American lives, and it goes all the way back to the late 1800s, um, and it starts in Alabama on the football field, actually. Um, and then Patriot Acts, which I think Aziz also mentioned, came out of that. Dave Eggers uh, reviewed Amrika and then recruited me to to curate that collection of first-person oral histories for this for the organization that he's founded called Voice of Witness. It's beautiful. If you don't know, you should check it out. Anyway, um, so uh, that was sort of like what my focus was on, writing about Arabs, Americans, and Muslim Americans, and sort of talking about these people on the margins. I never imagined like Syria was going to become like the story, and it's... Uh, it, I mean, from whether from domestic headlines to sort of international headlines. Obviously, you know, the so-called Islamic State is in Syria. The Syrian refugees are going to cause the EU to unravel. Uh, Donald Trump is afraid of Syrians. You know, it's kind of, it's just absolutely surreal when I think back to, to that playground incident. Um, and in 2011, right when everything seemed like it was starting to happen, I decided to, in the Middle East, I decided to pack up and I moved to Damascus and I stayed, spent the next two years there. I had always wanted to write a book about my grandmother and about Syria, but ironically, uh, there was no market for such a book until Syria fell apart. Uh, and this is, this is the book is, this is the book that I, I have written. Um, and the thing is, with Syria constantly being in the news, it's it's been such a reminder of the vagaries of fate, of how your lot uh, can really depend on the suffix that follows Syrian, whether it's refugee or immigrant or American, which is the case is my case, and what what really separates me. It's the only thing that separates me from the Syrians that are being unfairly uh, maligned, banned, and banished today. So I always I always say that my work comes too late. Um, you know, America sort of came years after 9-11, years after it needed to exist, and I, I kind of feel the same way about this book, which is um, also ironically getting a ton of attention just because Syria is falling apart. Um, I'm going to read to you a bit from it, because that's what I've been asked to do. You have to bear with me. This is the first time I'm actually reading from this book. So how many of you guys read the prologue? Okay. You made me like get that together in January. Okay, so um, then I'll give you a little, a little detail. I'll tell you a joke that's in the prologue so you understand. So, in, uh, do you need the Oh yeah, I'll start doing that now. Okay, this is a gratuitous slideshow just so if you're bored you have something to look at. It's not in any order, but these because I cover a hundred years of history in in Syria. These are some of the pictures that I used in the research. Some of the pictures that are in the book. Um, but what was I about to start telling you? Okay, so for the, I don't know how much those are uh, two of the characters in the book. Who are my parents? Those are the ones I was trying to get sent back to Syria in uh, my teenage years. Um, okay, so it's my mom's last day in Syria. That's my aunt on the same balcony, the same house that I restored. Uh, that's me breaking up their marriage, trying to. I was very jealous about it. This is my great grandmother and my grandmother and all my great uncles and aunts. Okay, I'm just going to try not, I'm not going to get distracted. You guys can get distracted. So, I don't know how much more. That's my mom, my mom, and my grandparents. So I write mostly about this woman, my grandmother. Um, there she is with the daughter of the Armenian family that we took in after the genocide. This is, this woman looks so unhappy to be married. There's my grandmother. <laughs> That's my great-grandfather in the Ottoman days. Because the book opened, there's, there he is in the 60s, still wearing his fez in Hama, which is where, it, that's famous Hama water mills. That's my grandfather. Um, that's me getting baptized way too late, like, in, in Syria. Because my parents, this is one of the pro-government manifestations that, like, unfortunately was happening outside my window. This is another grandfather in a machine he invented. Okay. This is a wedding where everybody was beautiful, clearly. Um, this is Damascus. These are very typical Damascus streets. Okay, um, that's my mom in her underwear. Okay, so 
basically, I don't know how much you guys know about Syria, but I, the, one of the things I try to, this my mom's pharmacy class in the University of Damascus. Um, so one of the things I explain in the prologue, just so that people set the scene, and it's one of the things I really explore in the book, is that, you know, I say that, Damascus, unlike other cities, has no anonymity. There's no disappearing into Damascus the way there is disappearing into like Paris or New York or anywhere, because there's over there's almost 20 different security bodies watching and informing on everybody, and and it's very insidious because all these branches are located in residential neighborhoods, um, and it got, they're called the Mukhabarat. And the way I explain them uh, is is they're a lot like the Stasi. Who knows? What, you guys know what the Stasi are? the famous East German secret police that were keeping tabs on everybody. And what I like to say about the Syrian Mukhabarat is like, what the Stasi had, what they, what the precision that the Stasi have, the Syrians, the Syrian Mukhabarat don't have. But what they lack, lack what they, they make up for, for that lack of precision with like serious gusto. And I tell a joke in the, in the uh, prologue that some of you, the three of you who raise your hands, uh, will, rem will hopefully remember. Um, or maybe I'll test you. So put your hands up now, huh? <laughs> but I'll tell it again. Um, it's not really, it's, it's like funny, like a screwed up way. Basically, so this is a joke that I heard in Syria in the 80s or the 90s that really sums it up perfectly. There's um, the, the CIA, the KGB at the time, because it was the Cold War, the Israeli Mossad and the Syrian Mukhabarat are all taken to this like elite training site, okay? It's on some island. There are these woods. Each of them, each team has to go in individually and find the fox and bring out the fox. So the CIA, boom, done, 15, you know, half an hour, 30 minutes, they're in and out. KGB, exactly 30 minutes. The Israelis are in and out in 15 minutes. I mean, that sort of tells you how, how, how much the Syrians had faith in their own Syrian military, which was always being talked about as who would vanquish the Israelis. The Syrian Mukhabara go in for four hours. Um, and they come back out, and they, unlike all the other agencies, don't come back out with the fox. They have a rabbit. This rabbit has been severely tortured. And all the other agencies are like, um, that's not a fox. And the Syrians have got their leather jackets on, and they're light up, and they're smoking, and they're like, he's a fox. He confessed. He says he's a fox. <laughs> And that gives you a little idea what the Syrian Mukhabarat are like. So that's that's kind of a little bit what is all, and that, that's been seeping into people's like skin and pores for the last 40 years of the regime. So I'm gonna, so this book that I wrote, um, see if it gets back to my great grandfather, it starts out kind of with my great grandfather, who was, and the reason I use him is his life is bookended in such a fascinating way. He was born in 1889, a subject of the Ottoman Empire. And he died in October 1970, the same month that Hafez al-Assad seizes power of Syria. So an incredible lifespan. And then it goes on to his daughter, my grandmother, and then my mother, and then me. And we all live in the same house. It's taken away from us in 1970, uh, the year, also the year Hafez al-Assad comes to power. Um, and we, it's, it's taken from us, and we only get it back in 2010. And we begin to restore it at the same time that the country begins to come apart. And I, that was sort of my cover story, because being uh, American, being a journalist, being you know, a human rights lawyer, like, these are things that can you know, get you killed in Syria. So, so I needed sort of like a reason for, because people were always asking, why are you here now? Why are you here now? And so I was always telling people I was there to restore the house, which was partly true. Um, yeah, this is like lambs to the slaughter. She's not, that's my great-grandfather. Um, than you see in the Fez. Anyway, so in 1992, it was my first time back to Damascus in about 10 years, and I was 17. Uh, so I'm just going to read you from that. I'm going to skip around a little but because you wanted to read it. How am I doing on time? Okay, that's not bad. Going through. Perfect. Okay, so this is Damascus, summer of 1992. I landed in Damascus on June 21st, 1992. Curious, excited, and tense, the advance instructions had been manifold. Do not say anything remotely political. Do not appear too American. Submit to whatever any, anyone appearing official demands of you. Everyone is watching, my family warned me. Best not to draw any unwanted attention to yourself. I was 17 and traveling alone. On my shoulder, I carried a heavy camcorder. You know, can't even imagine this, probably. My father wanted me to be his eyes and film as much as I could. He hadn't been home since 1986. Around my waist, I was wearing a black fanny pack with New Orleans scrawled across it in neon, neon pink. 
Through its band, I had also threaded a camera in its belt case, which declared Pentax in red letters. I also wore a ridiculous straw hat. I was arriving on a flight from Cairo that was packed with people from the region. Genetics aside, the way we dressed and carried ourselves was inescapably different. I had left the United States four days after graduating from public high school in Baltimore, where the post-graduation ritual was to go to Ocean City, Maryland, drink, and celebrate this milestone of the American teenage experience. My strict Syrian parents didn't really care about the American teenage experience, nor were they particularly sympathetic to the milestones as they had come up. I had only gone to a few dances and parties and only after arduous battles to convince them I would not end up an alcoholic or a drug addict. I knew a trip to the beach with my friends was never going to happen, so I didn't even bother to ask them if I could go. Yet, they had no problem sending me by myself to the Middle East and Europe, first to Egypt, then to Syria, and lastly to Germany. Lebanon, still not two years out of its civil war, was not on the agenda. I would spend the entire summer abroad with relatives. To my parents, these places were much less frightening than a teenage nirvana two hours away from Baltimore. It hadn't taken much convincing to get me to extend my stay in Syria, where my cousins had assured uh, extend my stay in Egypt, where my cousins had assured me that Syria had much less to offer. After all, they told me almost with a shudder, Syria only had three TV channels, unlike Egypt's five. These were the days long before rooftops were congested with satellite dishes that received beam programming faster than the sensors could forbid it. I could have stayed. I would have stayed on even longer and thought about changing my ticket again, but I had apparently already irritated relatives in Syria who had been expecting me just days days before. So I bid them a tearful farewell and we promised to write. Just a two-hour flight later, I landed in Syria. I could immediately tell from the looks of the airport in Damascus that maybe what my Egyptian cousins had said was true. Syria was years behind. At passport control, the uniformed man seemed initially amused by me as he took my passport. When he saw my name, he asked if I spoke Arabic. While my comprehension was fluent even, yet, even then, I had yet to feel confident about speaking it. Also, as of 1992, my vocabulary was limited. I knew the words for ingredients and spices relevant to the Syrian kitchen, household chores, anything related to school, college, or grade the Lord's Prayer, and a bevy of cuss words. But with the edict blended ringing in my ears, I answered, I did. He asked me if I was Syrian. I reflexively answered with barely suppressed indignation that no, I was an American. Where are your parents from, he asked. Syria, I answered, but I couldn't help adding that they were Americans too. Then you are Syrian, he chided me, and if you are Syrian, he said, you should have a Syrian passport. Don't you want a Syrian passport? I felt it was a trick question. I tried smiling and shrugged. Inshallah, while this literally means God willing, in a pinch it's a polite way to demure, to avoid giving a straight answer, and to shirk accountability or responsibility. Was he married, he then wanted to know. I bristled at the idea that he thought I might already be married. Couldn't he tell I was going to college at the end of the summer? It had always annoyed me as I was growing up that visiting Arabs would refer to me as an arus, a bride, and inquire as to whether I wanted a groom. Of course no one really had been trying to broker a child marriage. Still, it was an indication of what was generally expected to be the most important thing in life. Backwards Syria, I kept thinking. But then, in an effort not to seem too American, I simply answered the question, no. I wasn't married, and I tried to look as dejected about it as possible. <laughs> Finally, he waved me through. I could see the exit. It wasn't far. And readjusting my straw hat and the camcorder on my shoulder, I began to make my way there to greet my family. Suddenly, a man leaning against a wall pointed at me and summoned me to follow him into the unmarked room behind him. Apparently, a whole world existed in the short distance between where I stood and where I wanted to go, a world in which there were several different functionaries whose whims I could be subject to. I looked for some signage, for some explanation, but there was none. I realized later that I wasn't meant to understand what was going on or to ever feel like I was sure of anything. This would be the case with most of the interactions I had with the Syrian state. The arbitrariness was one of the myriad ways of controlling society and extracting its submission. I had no choice but to follow. Once we were inside the small, cramped room, he closed the door behind us. We stood in silence for what seemed like an eternity as he stared at me. Who was it? Who was I, he wanted to know. What was I doing in Syria? Where was I going to stay? Who was I staying with? I answered to the best of my abilities. I was on vacation. I was visiting Damascus. I was staying with my grandfather. He, too, asked me why I didn't have a Syrian passport, if I was Syrian, as I clearly was. I shrugged and explained, I was born in America. Then he pointed to the camcorder still slung over my shoulder. Where was it from, he wanted to know. America? What was I going to do with it? Film stuff, I answered, hesitantly, afraid this was so obvious, perhaps I hadn't understood the question. Was it staying in the country? No, I answered, relieved to finally be catching his drift. Good. Make sure you take it with you, he told me. Don't sell it to anyone. 
He then said that I needed to register the camcorder in a tone that suggested there was a regularity to this procedure, not that it was being made up as we went along. In retrospect, I realized that register was a euphemism. What he really wanted was a bribe to let me through. Of course, I said, how do I register it? He held out his hand and beckoned for my passport and scribbled on the last page RCA, which was the make, and one of the, some, one of the random numbers he found on the camcorder. There was nothing to suggest that the next official would even know to look there. All of it struck me as completely random. I had that passport for another five years, and whenever I would see his, in, his ineligible scrawl again, I couldn't help but grimace. Smiling at me, he asked my age, which was simple math, considering he had my passport in his hands. And before I could answer, even answer, he asked if I was betrothed. I was getting increasingly irritated. I had always been on the defensive in the U.S. about being Arab, as Arabs were endlessly maligned, and the American imagination often portrayed as hopelessly backward. I had tried with the skill of a preteen and then a teenager to explain geopolitics to my classmates and teachers, while also trying to represent who I was an alternative image of Arabs. The previous year's war with Iraq and my father's mistimed decision to grow a mustache that made him look like Saddam Hussein had made it all the more fraught. Now, my first five minutes in Syria, I was frustrated by these Syrian officials proving some of the stereotypes correct. No, I'm not engaged, I told the guard. I told the guard. Hearing the annoyance in my own voice, I added, inshallah soon, and tried to smile. The man then handed me back my passport, and as I took it, he held on to it a bit longer so that we were both holding at the same time. Was he going to change his mind, I started to wonder. Welcome in Syria, he said in poor English, finally letting it go. I resisted the urge to correct him and backed out into the main hall. I quickly looked to see how many doors there were, wondering if I'd have to go behind any more. Then a jittery man in an orange jumpsuit approached me. He was looking for an Ali Malik. Yes, that's me, I said, surprising him as I went to shake his hand, which he took hesitantly. He had been hunting everywhere for me, he said. While never looking me in the eye, he ushered me towards the exit. When he saw my great uncle who was waiting outside, he heard me, hurried me along and delivered me to him. Then he began obsequiously asking forgiveness for the delay, addressing my great uncle repeatedly as professor and doctor. Of, se of my grandmother's siblings, I knew, I knew this un great uncle the best, as well as his beautiful American wife, Clara, and their six kids. We'd visit them in Cape Cod, where they were in summer. I was so relieved to see a familiar face, but he was cross with me for having taken so long. In English, he snapped at me. Why had I not met with the man in the orange jumpsuit? I didn't know I was supposed to meet him. Turning to the man, my great uncle thanked him and dismissed him. As he did, I saw him slip money into his hand. God keep you, oh doctor, oh professor. The man bobbed his head, bowing. Suddenly embarrassed by my handshake, I hid my hand behind my back. That was the beginning of that trip in 1992. Um, should I read one more passage or yes, no? Questions? Talking? No? Hummus? I saw there was someone out there. Read? Okay, I'll just read one little one from, this is, um, this is also kind of dark too. This was, this is now the spring of 2011. I've moved to Syria and um, this is the, this is May of 2011 if I'm not mistaken. I, uh, I had just come back from Cairo where I was covering, I had been covering stuff in Egypt uh, and I just landed back in, in Syria, and, I, and I, so this is where it picks up. It, when I landed, it was to news of the death of Hamza al-Khatib, a Syrian 13-year-old. I thought this would either quickly force a Syrian to hire a square or see to it that there wouldn't be one anytime soon. Hamza's school portrait became ubiquitous. It showed a chubby boy wearing a polo shirt under a baby blue sweater. The background looked like a blue sky swirled, swirled with the yellow of the sun, rays of light radiating from the center that almost cast a halo around Hamza's head. Where other boys might start to look like young men at 13, Hamza was still on the childish side of the age. Everyone in Syria became familiar with his portrait of him and one other. It's still taken from a video of him after death, a naked and bloated corpse, no longer the color of flesh, but nearly purple from all the bruising. Security forces had arrested Hamza on April 29th in Dara, four days after I had arrived in Damascus, for attending a rally with his family. But no one would hear of it until nearly a month later when Hamza's body was returned. According to activists at the time, it was released to the family on the condition they say nothing. A video, however, was, however, was made and circulated, soon reaching global networks like Al Jazeera. The body showed many signs of torture. There were bullet wounds on his arms. He had black eyes, cuts, injuries consistent with electric shock devices, bruises, and whip marks. His neck had been broken, and he had been castrated. While American media often sanitize what viewers can see of what can be done to a human body, the same cannot be said for Arab audiences. Images from Iraq and Palestine had not been sanitized for years. And yet what we saw of Hamza, which clearly showed violence done to a Syrian boy by the Syrian regime, shocked those who were willing to look. 
Hamza's father was briefly detained when the video came out. Syrians were put on notice. An expose to be shown on state TV would give us the truth. When it aired, doctors on camera made the case that these injuries were required after Hamza's death, and certainly not while the regime had him in custody. The doctors who testified on TV said the marks on his body were not signs of torture, but had been faked by conspirators who wanted to agitate the Syrian people. To allay any doubts, Hemza's father and uncle appeared on state TV in a pre-recorded conversation and said that they trusted Assad, who they added had pledged to look into the circumstances of Hamza's death. At first, I wondered why the regime had bothered with the charade. No one around me seemed to believe that anyone else but the regime had done this to the child, even though some insinuated he, that he or his parents were at fault for ignoring what they should have known were possible consequences for participating in the rally. But I began to understand that we weren't meant to be convinced. This was how the regime could hide a threat in plain sight. A state TV lingered on the bodily mutilation, speaking calmly about how the wounds were inflicted post-mortem. We were meant to actually look at and commit to memory the damage that can be done to a body, even to a boy. The message? Be grateful this is not your child. It was a master class in how to hear, read, and speak the coded language, the one that exists between dictator and dictated. What happened to Hamza taught me that what many Syrians who were hesitant to confront the regime feared most was not instability or the Badil, the alternative to the regime. They had, whether consciously or subconsciously, understood that the regime would, like an abusive parent, punish them severely for their misbehavior, as if Syrians demanding reforms were just children. Really, the regime had survived for years on an intricate architecture that made children out of adults. To remind anyone getting any ideas to the contrary, the regime began to make corpses out of children, as it did with Hamza. Not uplifting, you know.